Hello there, and welcome to Red Moon Roleplaying. We're going to be beginning something new here today. And uh, you have me, Matthias, here, and you have Craig. Good evening, Patreons and listeners alike. Yes, indeed. And we have Yalmar here. Hello there. Yes, and the thing that makes today so special is that we are joined by a guest and game master, uh, and it is Matthew Dawkins, who you may know as the Gentleman Gamer. Welcome, Matthew. Very happy to be here. So, for uh, those of our listeners who are not familiar with uh, with Matthew Dawkins or the Gentleman Gamer, can you perhaps say a f- few words about uh, yeah about who you are and what you've been doing so far? Well, as uh, as introduced, my name is Matthew Dawkins. I'm a writer and developer in role playing games and and for some video games too. But my greatest experience, the thing I'm most known for, is my association with Vampire the Masquerade. I've been writing and developing for Vampire for around five years, and I've got credits such as Beckett's Jihad Diary, V5, Chicago by Night, and a slew of other books to my name. I've also worked on Cult, on various Chronicles of Darkness books, Modern Age, Call of Cthulhu, and a whole bunch of others. I've uh, I've been working quite prolifically for the last handful of years. And I also have a YouTube channel, which is called The Gentleman Gamer, uh, which I've recently taken over to the Onyx Path YouTube channel, uh, where I, I guess, made my name in vlogging circles as uh, The Gentleman's Guide to Vampires and later The Pentex Guide to Werewolves, which proved to be a very popular series, introducing people to the concepts and groups within Wealth of the Apocalypse and Vampire the Masquerade. This game that we're going to be running is They Came From Beneath the Sea. And they Came From Beneath the Sea was initially a concept that uh, I guess I came up with around 10 years ago. And back then it was a very different game to what it is now. Uh, in the last few years I pitched the concept, once it had been refined, play tested a little, to Rich Thomas of Onyx Path Publishing, a frequent employer of mine, and he liked it enough to purchase it from me. We have then gone on to write the game in full, develop it. Art is now rolling in. There's a successful Kickstarter currently running with around a week left at time of recording. And They Came From Beneath the Sea is, or can best be summed up as a game of 1950s B-movie sci-fi. With as much hilarity or horror as the group playing deems necessary. So that is what we will be playing today. Yes, indeed. And we are very, very much uh, looking forward to that. So what we will be beginning with, I suppose, is trying to define who we will be playing. So, Matthew, why don't you take us into that process? So if you three, the players, cast your minds to 1950s America, you can no doubt picture the white picket fences, the hot rods, the greasers with their slick back hair, the drive-in theatres, the diners selling one dollar milkshakes, Jerry Lee Lewis probably belting something over the radio, and the like. You've all seen the kinds of movies, the happy days like TV shows, you can picture that idyllic post-war America that seems strangely guarded and yet oblivious to the threat of nuclear war that's just potentially around the corner. Despite the fact that everyone is living in these ideal, sterile homes, we are presented in the media with the horror of Cold War. And yet it comes in the form of alien movies, alien invasion movies, movies like Them, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, It Came from Beneath the Sea, and other movies like that are all rough metaphors for Soviet invasion, communist threat, intruders uh, posing as humans, invasions of the body snatchers. And this is the world in which your characters live. As far as they're concerned, maybe life couldn't be much better. But to some, there's going to be a slight edge. They may be a bit paranoid. Maybe they have only just recovered from the horrors of the Second World War. Maybe they've only just returned from Korea. And they know that this ideal world cannot last. 
And that's where we come in for they came from beneath the sea. The ideal cannot hold. Something is going to break this veneer of perfection. So our characters, the first thing we do is come up with just a general concept. And in our book, we give various conceptual ideas, such as Monster Hunter, reporter who gets in too deep, an out-of-touch suburban housewife, or an ex-military conspiracy theorist. All we need at this point are your one-liners, things to define the kind of character you want to play. And this may give us some indication as to the, uh, the various origins and archetypes you will later pick in character creation. So, starting with Craig, what, uh, what concept do you have in mind for your character? Well, hard to put into words, but I think the idea I was going with was the concept of the well-funded extremely intelligent but perhaps slightly aloof scientist out there finding things for himself but mm, older and perhaps not quite uh, social or pleasant but perhaps if we put that in a sentence let's say what do you guys think well misanthropic I'd... scientist yes there we go yes that's good Misanthropic scientist. Okay, and Hialma, how about you? Um, yes. I'm gonna play Benny Clyde Rosberg, or BC as they call him. He is a high altitude show off. He uh, works on construction sites, preferably high up in the air. He likes to do things that draw attention to himself. He can do anything if people are watching. Okay, lovely. And Matthias? I shall be playing Jonas Faulkner, an FBI agent with something to prove. My uh, idea is that Jonas here comes from what was a rich household uh, in Oklahoma, but then the Dust Bowl came and they lost everything. He ended up going to Korea and yeah, now he's with the FBI, but he cannot forget the humiliation and, and shame from his from his childhood, from, from losing everything and from being this worthless Oki. So he's got something to prove uh, and he wants to crack a big case. So yeah, an FBI agent with something to prove. Lovely, okay. Well, it sounds like you've actually got the building blocks very much in place for each of your characters. Next step, usually, on character creation would be to set up your aspirations. Now, the way aspirations work, they're very much meta uh, factors. They aren't your character's goals, they're your goals as players. And so usually you set up two short-term ones, one long-term one. The short-term ones are things you wish to achieve in a single session long term in the course of a story and they tend to work communally because if you can achieve a short-term aspiration for a character the entire group gets rewarded with experience so the idea being that you will help each other as players achieve the kind of things you want so um, we don't have to break it down entirely because we know that uh, we know pragmatically speaking we're not going to be playing this for months and months so Let's, for the time being, just look at a single short-term aspiration. What is the kind of thing that the, uh, the three of you want to achieve for each of your characters by the end of our first session? I was thinking for, uh, for Jonas Faulkner here, he... Um, obviously, I'm not entirely sure on, on exactly what circumstances we will find ourselves in, but as an FBI agent uh, who wants to crack a big case, he's, of course, going to want to find that that lead, that first thing that sort of draws him towards something greater, you know, that, uh, yeah, starting to unravel the mystery. Okay, so yeah, you're, you're, we'll, we'll say uncover a mystery, first yes. of all. It means you don't have to solve it, there's less pressure on you. Hmm, excellent. <laughs> I think in my case, at this point in time, being a little uninspired by the way the world's going, I would love to just find something new, something to inspire me. For future research, something maybe beyond what man is currently achieving. Yes, that would definitely be just the, you know, learning of it as opposed to understanding it at this point. Yeah, so in any other in other, any other world, in any other game, the idea of discovering something new in a single session might seem a, uh, a tall order, but in this game that should be quite achievable. 
And how about B.C. Rosberg? Well, B.C. Um, lives to uh, he lives to impress people, so I think that my short-term aspiration would to impress someone that he doesn't know already. Or proves to someone that he knows that he can do something that's different. He, I, I, I just have um, impressed someone currently. What do you think about that? I think that works nicely. It gives the three of you different aspirations. Uh, they, they can work quite nicely in sync with each other. And you can set each other up to, to achieve those aspirations. So that's good. So next up is the paths, and we're already on step two of the character creation. We are we, we go through it pretty quickly in this game, thankfully. Uh, there's three paths that the characters are defined by in the story path system, which is the system they came from beneath the sea users. And those three paths are archetype, origin, and ambition. Uh, they help to find the skills you have access to at the start of the game, along with uh, trademarks that are tied to it, and some other uh, tropes, some powers that are specific to your archetype. Before we get into that in detail, we will look at your archetypes first, because archetypes tend to be the things people focus on most. They're your classes, your clans, and so on. Uh, so archetypes in this game fall into five camps. We have everyman, those are your blue-collar working-class heroes just wanting to defend their patch of land. You have your G-men, your government agents, your sheriffs, any kind of municipal force or federal force in the game, someone with authority. You have your scientists, mad or otherwise, uh, experimental or otherwise. Um, they could have been smuggled to America from a hostile country in the 1940s. We don't know. You can uh, decide on that. Uh, we have our mouths. Now, mouths are your plucky journalists, your entertainers, your reporters on the scene, your actors who just want to make a big break, or your travelling musicians who just happen to stumble into these uh, horrible calamities. And then you have your survivors. Survivors are your grizzled veterans, your survivors of the Second World War, of Korea, people who may well now live out in the wilderness and want to just be left alone until, of course, danger comes calling. Now, I am going to say at this point that this game is taking a slightly more horrific turn than most games of They Came From Beneath the Sea. Your characters aren't going to be, or may start as, plucky, upbeat, optimistic, young things but they probably won't be by the end of it. And therefore, you should keep in mind that whatever archetype you pick, you may want to take it with a slightly more jaded edge or, or a view to what you can get out of it rather than how to defend your common man. Now, you may, may end up leaning toward that anyway, but uh, I guess on the D&D &D alignment scale, consider your characters neutral at best. So you're thinking, like, not to... Uh, I mean, a bit more selfish characters, or...? Yeah, yeah. Uh, these are still going to be uh, characters in a B-movie, but it's a B-movie more on the horror vein than the sci-fi vein, I think. Uh, you're, and li like you say, in those kinds of movies, characters do tend to act with a little more self-awareness uh, maybe uh, a little more selfishness and they will throw the slow person in the path of the rolling monstrosity in order to save themselves so i'll go first as i've already chosen the archetype scientist dr charles white i'm in my 50s and i'm certainly an aged learned man lovely and how about hyama um, well, my character is sort of swimming a little between the everyman and the mouth, uh, but I don't want him to be the sort of... He loves to show off, he loves the um, being in the centre of attention, but he's not trying to make his living as such, which I think sort of makes him more towards the everyman. He, he likes to be in a, a, a normal setting where he can show off. So I guess like a, fi a small fish in a... Or a big fish in a small pond, I don't know. Mm. Um so I, I, I'd say he would be an everyman more than a loudmouth, but I do like the idea of that you can choose your tropes, which we'll be getting to later, that you get to choose one from another uh, archetype exactly. that still applies. Yes, and then you can make this sort of mix. But I'll, I'll say everyman for now. Okay, well that just leaves you, Matthias. Well, I shall of course be a G-man. There's nothing more G than uh, an FBI agent, so there you go. 
Exactly. So next we move on to our origin. And origins are, well, refer to your character's upbringing. Uh, we provide some examples in the book, including suburban, army veteran, touched by an alien, life of privilege, and adventurer. You can also have religious upbringing, uh, or if you like. Uh, we haven't inc included this in the book, but if we're going the more horrific element, you can imagine a more fundamentalist upbringing, a more cloistered origin, someone who has been kept away from society, if you particularly want. Now, I don't know that any of your characters are going for that, but uh, it's something you may want to consider. All of these are innately customizable, except for the archetypes, which are at this point defined as the five in the book. Our origins and ambitions can be uh, made up as you see fit. So do you see any particular origin in mind for your, your character, Craig? Well, looking at the ones available and thinking about what I had in mind, Life of Privilege probably fits it quite closely. Mm. Uh, as in, I, uh, well, originally I'm an English gentleman, and so being a young man in the 1900s to become what I've become today, I would have had to have had a very good old family and gone to the best universities for the time. So I definitely think I had a very good, educated, well-connected upbringing. So maybe that one could be the one we go with. Okay, I think it works. It makes sense given that your character seems quite jaded to reality as well. He's uh, probably experienced a lot due to his life of privilege. I have indeed, and not all of it pleasant, but we can leave that for later. But yes, so if I go with that one, then how would we go with things like, for example, the skills? Well, each path has four skills associated with it. It can be the same skills, you can repeat them over and over again. The point being that when you play your path, uh, when you get your experience points, you get to assign them to one of the three path elements of your character. So if you, are, if you wish to essentially level up your origin, you can assign your experience to the skills associated with your origin. If you want to level up your scientist archetype, you can assign your points to that. So we, we pick four skills at this point to go with each, uh, each path. Uh, the archetype is the only one where those skills are generally defined, but the but in honesty, you do have customizability. You can uh, make the characters whatever you see fit, if you wish. It's just we we generally uh, offer, I guess, a a diverse range of skills if you pick a an interesting range of archetypes, origins, and ambitions. So I would suggest that because uh, listeners may not find it terribly interesting, we won't go through the breakdown of skill by skill necessarily, or, the, or we might do that, but we probably won't go into point allocation um, because people don't want to hear numbers. But when we have gone through origins and ambitions, I'll quickly go through the three of you and you can tell me the kind of skills you have in mind for your characters. And if you can note them down, that would be useful. Excellent. All right, yeah, let's do that then. So for now, I will say I will go with the life of privilege, Orgin. Okay, and what I will set up, also ask, I'll ask you to pick your ambition as well now, Craig, because if you do that, you can start looking at the skills at this early point, and then by the time we get back round to you, you should have some skills in mind. Of course. So for ambition, that would be... How would you explain that? So ambition is what drives your character. It's what your character's goals are rather than uh, you. Now it's often through lens of community. Uh, why do you why do you essentially do what you do as this jaded scientist? And these can be grandiose or they can be minor. It may be because you're a family man. It may be because you're a lone wolf. It may be because you want to become a community leader or because you want to earn money or you want revenge. I think we even have an example later on of you just want to be friends with someone. <laughs> you know, you, you're lonely and you want somebody. And so that can be an ambition. They can be as simplistic or as complex as you like. Well, then let's go with this. I'll explain what I think I want and you can then best fit me. I believe that when I was a younger man, my goals as a scientist were very for the good of the world. I wanted to make the world a better place. Unfortunately, I experienced some great tragedy early in my life. Maybe we'll go into that later. Let's just say, though, that the consequences of that tragedy meant that rather than 
wanting to do it for the betterment of the world in general, I wanted to do it in spite of the world. The world is a flawed and awful place, and I will find a way to improve it, no matter what other people maybe think. Okay, hmm. I'm almost tempted to put that down as out for revenge, using the, uh, using the example there, because you are, as you say, doing this out of spite for the world. Yes, I'll be honest, I was actually looking at that one as well and thinking, especially when I give you the details later on, mm. maybe yeah, I, you... I definitely do blame someone. Yeah, uh, whether it's the rest of humanity, a specific person, or society in general, or what have you, you are out for revenge in a very uh, specific kind of a way. So go for that. Excellent. All right, so I'll go for that one, and now I'll start looking over some of those skills. Did you say each So each path has how many skills? Uh, so you get four skills associated with the path, which four skills are up to you, uh, but you should be prepared to justify non-obvious choices. You gain three dots to distribute among the four skills you choose for each path. So one of them, at least one of them, is going to be empty. Uh, a player may choose to put all three dots in one skill, divide the dots among two or three skills. You may not use dots from one path for skills associated with a different path. And total then, if you've chosen three paths, the archetype the origin and the ambition that would mean you're choosing from a list of one two three four five six eight nine twelve skills twelve skills yes. nine dots very good they may well overlap those skills mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes you can have for instance aim twice if you particularly want uh, and that just means you put, can potentially put more dots in aim at character generation because uh, you have aim for your origin your and your archetype, or your archetype and your ambition, for instance. Uh, so when we move on to Hjalmar, we have to decide on your origin and ambition as well. Have you had any thoughts regarding this? Um, I've been looking through the origins and the ambitions, and I think I might need your help <clears throat> just to make a final decision. Um, I want him to be this... He come, he's comes from a, from a hard-working family... He wants to prove that if I can do it, anyone can do it. He wants to impress people. He wants everyone, ultimately, to have his photo on the wall there in their homes. Um, but he comes from a kind of n not very interesting kind of origin. And I'm either looking at the adventurer origin as tying that together with how he has become this... Uh, working on skyscrapers on high altitude, he thrives on uh, being up there in a sort of uh, extreme situation working or he could, I don't know if he has a connection to the street and being a street rat I think street rat or even the, uh, I guess the contrarian in me says go for suburbia uh, you're the kind of person that lives for, for the thrill because you grew up in relative comfort and so adventurer would imply that you've always been this way. I almost see your character as, uh, I guess, breaking into this need for speed, if you like, when when you've grown up because you wanted to break free from from the mold that society set for you. Yeah. So uh, up I to like you that. how you see your characters. I guess social class, whether you'd go for street rat or suburbia. Well, it's kind of grown out of growing up I suppose but maybe he was doing it fabulous when he was growing up as well he was trying to show off he didn't do very well in school but he yeah maybe that comes from being in a sort of too secure uh, kind of lifestyle let's go for that let's go for suburbia yeah let's do that and that leaves you with ambition now there's a whole bunch of ambitions provided uh, I would almost suggest that the adventurer origin path, we move to the ambition uh, section for your yeah. character. Uh, yeah. Because there's no reason that you can't in this game. They are just examples. So your character wants to be seen as an adventurer, this high-risk taker, and probably wants to win, well, not necessarily awards, but applause from other people. As we know, your aspiration is for this character to uh, w uh, to impress someone. So I think um, looking at the adventurer's skills uh, at origin point, you could probably apply that to your ambition pretty easily. 
Yeah, I could see that, definitely. So uh, I'll put that for now the, and, and transfer whatever we've got there from skills and trademarks and stuff. Yeah, yeah cool. again, by all means, if you find that the skills that your character is allocated don't fit your concept, switch them around. There, there is uh, no definition when it comes to skills. It just requires justification if you decide to pick aim and, um, I don't know, any kind of fighting skill and you pick suburbia as an example but if you've picked yeah. adventurer it makes more sense yeah okay cool thanks uh so that just leaves us with our agent falkner matthias indeed so uh when i'm looking at origin path i'm thinking that that jonas here uh, the family as i said they he comes from a rich background he comes from having gotten pretty good schooling early on but then uh, then the Dust Bowl hit, then they lost everything. And basically, his family had to move to move to the city. And, and they came with, ultimately came with very little and ended up, I don't know, maybe it's not the city. Maybe it's, I'm thinking these fruit fields, yeah? They, they were these Okies who had to, to work these fruit fields for, uh, for almost no money. Maybe they had to have other jobs on top of that. And they still wanted Jonas to go to school. But I think maybe... Maybe he ended up uh, without having parents so close by. They were perhaps quite absent because they were working three jobs. So he ended up uh, probably getting in touch with, yeah, with the streets, with uh, with the kids who didn't have a family because effectively he kind of didn't. Um, so I was thinking about the street rat. Yeah, I know. I think that would work well. Uh, initially, I was going to suggest army veteran, but. I think, in a way, the being a street rat as a child probably had more impact on your character than serving for a few years in the army. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I'm thinking, and it also sort of connects well, I think, with with some of the aspects of my background story there. So I I, I like street rat, and and I I like that sort of being sort of the big drive that he has really to sort of that he comes back to that and comes back to his experiences there and and wanting to to really prove prove himself and maybe then leading into ambition where I was thinking family man and I was thinking that he wants to be able to to take care of his family he still has contact with them and he wants them to be proud of him and he wants to make sure that they can they can live a, a comfortable life I think he's probably sending them quite a lot of money already today but but he has an ambition probably to to provide even more somehow and that 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 his family is important to him um and that that's where his focus lies on, on some level and i think that's that's an interesting take on a g-man character you, you often see them as nothing but hard-boiled career men but the idea of him having the ambition of being a family man being able to settle down have a normal life after the uh, rough upbringing that he's endured, the military service, and now service to the government investigating who knows what, is quite, uh, quite well, aspirational, to, to use the wrong term for this game, but I think that, that works out well. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun to see how well that goes. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll get on to the next stages. Uh, this uh, The book does explain that each path lists several trademarks available to the path. Uh, trademarks, you get. You might want to note this, you get one trademark for your origin, one for your ambition, two for your archetype. And trademarks are, in World of Darkness or Chronicles of Darkness terms, your specialities, ways you use your skills or attributes in a way that uh, are particularly fitting for your character. But unlike those games, it isn't aim and the speciality is pistols. You would usually have some kind of descriptive text that you would have to tie in to the use of that weapon or to the use of that skill or the use of that attribute. And it gives you a bit of creative freedom rather than restricting you to always being the guy running around with a pistol. It's how you describe that trademark that you end up using it. But we'll get on to that in, in future. Uh, it won't take long for us to get there. Uh, so now we actually move on to skills themselves. So we've already ascertained that you would have received nine dots because of uh, what you're assigned per path. 
you get an additional six dots to distribute among any of the skills, and the skills don't have to be tied to your paths in any way. Uh, so that basically totals with you having 15 dots throughout your skills. Uh, what I would suggest is, and you don't have to follow this if you particularly want for characters to have more than um, five dots at this point, you can do it, but I generally suggest that no one goes over five dots in a skill at this point. It does make them rather over-focused. Uh, likewise, um, we don't really need to break down exactly how many dots you have in the skills. As mentioned, listeners probably aren't going to be terribly interested in that. So what I will say, now that you've had a bit of time to look over your skills, Craig, mm-hmm. and I and you and if you've uh, opened up the chapter four, which actually lays out all of the skills in the game, uh, you may have found some that you weren't immediately aware of. But if not, that's fine. What skills are you thinking are going to be the strengths for your character, and which ones do you think that that they are going to particularly suffer in the use of? Well, I just went straight up for saying that I would put all my points into enigmas and science, primarily because I am a scientist, that is my main interest, and enigmas as well is my mystery solving or desire to find out more. And then, between my then background of a life of privilege and I, you know, believed I'd have a little bit of culture and integrity, and then, in terms of my revenge, I think actually that was where I took most of the Enigma points from, really, was because it's more I've been inspired to find out more about the world because the world needs fixing rather than because it's a good place. I also threw some of those three points in technology because, again, science, technology. So I think those are my five things I would say I have skill in. And uh, how about you, Hialmar? Yes, I am just looking at the sort of lists of skills now, and I'm not really sure which ones would be best associated with the different ones. Uh, Archetype-wise, hmm, I might need a bit of hand here, because what I've got here from the original rules is that you could have aim, culture, larceny, and technology. Mm Mm-hmm. But then you could actually have like anything if you're in every, if 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 you're motivated, is that is that right? Yeah, you can you can move uh, your skills around however you see fit, really, um, and every man especially that's the case because as as a blue collar worker, uh, you could theoretically be trained in anything. Yeah, I don't really see him having aim. Is that sort of just? Uh... Shooting, basically. Or? Yeah, it will be it will be shooting, and because the game is uh, predominantly focused in America, there's a certain, I guess, tradition to the working classes firing weapons. Um, yeah. But <laughs> and especially if you've, uh, but I think, well, I was going to say especially if you've served in the military. But your character seems to me a bit maybe young to have done that, or maybe just brushed by 1945 hitting the age where he could have True. joined, but uh, maybe maybe he got out of it on an injury, uh, hence his suburban background. Um, maybe he had bone spurs, you never know. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would say um, for your, let's see, for your everyman... It depends on the kind of blue-collar background your character was from. Let's think of who his parents might have been. Was his dad an engineer, maybe, or or some kind of, or a plumber? You know that all that kind of thing leads to uh, technology. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm thinking perhaps more like plumber. Yes, yes, yeah, but yeah, it's a bit of technology there. So you might want to use technology. Maybe use pilot. Maybe your dad had you driving the uh, the pickup from job to job yeah. uh, pilot uh, equates to drive in this uh, in this game as well yeah I like that um, now you would, don't necessarily have to take larceny, larceny doesn't just have to be theft, it is sleight of hand I guess uh, no I don't really like larceny for him but I do like culture as in watching TV and watching the news or reading the news and things like that ok so those three skills are probably what you're going to be looking at maybe one dot each for your origin uh, in terms of your archetype, 
Oh, no, sorry, that is your archetype. In terms of your origin, which was suburbia, um, that would also play into culture, maybe. And um, I would also think, perhaps, let's think, uh, integrity. If uh, you were, if your family were honest in what they did. Yeah, I like that. I like uh, him being a very upfront kind of character. Mm -hmm. I, I've been looking at the tropes and stuff, and I like the idea of the sort of, uh, yeah, being honest. Honesty is the best policy kind mm. of thing. Yeah, I think uh, your origin and archetype actually tie very nicely into each other. So don't be afraid to have a little bit of crossover there in terms of your skills. Uh, if if you feel one very much feeds into the other, that it was your suburban upbringing that led you to be an everyman, then by all means uh, have a bit of crossover, maybe uh, have a different fourth skill each time, but it does mean you get six points to spread between, you know, uh, theoretical eight skills. We could actually narrow that down to six skills if you've got a lot of crossover there. Yeah, true, true. But it is, is it three or four? It's four skills that you choose, and then you can put uh, three bot dots between them, right? Yeah, three per path. Yeah, I suppose we. If if it would make s sense to always have the, uh, if aim is a is a common thing that you would do, everyone has a, a gun. Basically, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe he has it as an archetype skill as well. If if we choose, have to choose four. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. You can still choose a fourth one. Doesn't mean you have to put any points in it yet. And uh, then we have your uh, final path, which is your adventurer, where I think athletics has definitely got to play a role. True, yes, let's put that there. Um, probably even pilot again. Yes, I was thinking that too, actually. So maybe I pilot again and... We don't often get characters with a skill repeated three times across three paths, but I think this could be quite interesting. It would imply, I guess, your character is on the right course uh, for as far as his fate is concerned. Oh, you do mean that uh, pilot-wise, that it goes through the sort of through the uh, archetype, the origin, and the ambition? Well, I'm I'm seeing it there in your everyman archetype. If I guess you were working as an apprentice plumber, you would you were simply driving a vehicle around. Uh, in terms of suburbia, up to you whether it appears there. But I think it would definitely appear as an adventurer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fun. That's fun. Uh, maybe uh, put in close combat in adventurer. Yeah. As well. Yeah, you may have got into a few fights. Or, or simply have uh, practiced some of these new martial arts that have become quite popular in the media. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And That's... and I think survival might make sense as well as an adventurer. If you've been uh, parachuting out of planes and landing in the wilderness and having to spend a week trekking back to civilization because that's the kind of fun you enjoy, survival may be, the, may be a thing for you. Is that available for people, or should we just say that? Uh, survival is a skill in the game, so you can pick it. No, I meant like a thing like that, like parachuting out in the wilderness. Well, how about this? Uh, I don't want to necessarily fall on the trope that your parents are dead and you've inherited all their wealth, but I think maybe in the last couple of years, after you made a bit of a, a career for yourself, you've, you, you're hopeless at saving money. You you do not share your parents' sentiments for keeping everything back for a rainy day and for when the next recession comes. They lived through the Great Depression. Uh, you probably didn't. You know, you, you're too young for that. So uh, your idea of uh, profit is spend it immediately. And so you you are a high risk flyer and adventurer. As soon as you get a bit of cash in, you use it on the next harebrained scheme. Yeah, exactly, and hope that someone pays attention so that uh, I can show that what, of what, I, what I've done. And uh... Yeah, well, it won't be long until Evil Knievel and other figures like that start appearing on TV doing uh, ridiculous stunts for the amusement of you know, onlookers. You know, it's only, uh, it's only so far advanced from carnival uh, you know, trapeze artists and the like. Yeah, exactly. Though he doesn't have the ambition to sort of train or go to an academy to, to, to evolve those kind of specific acrobatic skills or something like that, for example. He'd rather be just seen picking something up and doing it on the fly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he, he wants to appear on talent contests, but doesn't want the formal training. Yeah. So that just leaves us with our G-Man. 
Indeed. So, um, when we look at the G-Man path, then, I see aim and I see integrity as being quite uh, important skills, uh, or quite important things there. He definitely knows how to shoot a gun. And he can... Maybe command as well. It depends. Uh, if you are a um, if you're a quiet investigator, command may not be effective. Uh, but if you are the kind of person that wants to be able to walk into a local uh, pub or diner, hold up a badge, and say you know, "FBI, you're going to answer my questions," you're probably going to need at least one dot in command. I think that sounds like a very good idea. Actually, I didn't think to include that, but uh, yes, command. Certainly. So yeah, aim, integrity, and command, then. And then we have your origin of street rat. Yes, and here I was thinking that larceny would be a really fun thing to bring with me from my from my youth. Uh, being able to go places where you're not supposed to be able to go, and pick, pick things, take things that are not yours, necessarily. Uh, that... Uh, that that can be a useful uh, skill to have uh, in when you are investigating things. And, and uh, yes, so I'm thinking larceny. It's a fun one. Oh, definitely. And then athletics. Uh, I think he has run from trouble uh, more than once, and uh, that is, of course, something that you have to be able to do. It, it would also fit in with the the, the background of, of being in the uh, being in the army, and I, I suppose. You know, if you are uh, an agent, there are certain physical uh, requirements attached to that as well. So, athletics uh, and larceny for street rat. Okay. And, uh, yeah, by all means, pick another couple, even if you're not allocating dots to them. We still want to keep in mind four skills per path, even if you're not using all of them yet. And then we have your ambition. Yes, yeah, so family man. And uh, here, empathy... Um, it would be nice to have one character with empathy, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, that would be <laughs> would be a plus. No, but but I, I I see that he in in the war he worked uh, he ended up working as an interrogator and being able to read people and being able to influence people and I think later on when it comes to things like manipulate, um, I see that that's something he he should be able to to handle himself in in a violent situation through you know his gun, but. But I would rather really solve problems by talking to people and and trying to find the truth that way. So yeah, empathy feels like a really, really good one to take there. Okay. Uh, I would suggest also it may be useful to have persuasion. Right. Uh, now, whether you'd want to tie that to either of your previous paths or your family man one, I think persuasion can work. Uh, after all, you know, even at its most mundane level, uh, trying to persuade the kids to go to bed or trying to persuade your wife not to leave you because you've been out late working again, that kind of thing, uh, is uh, a skill you may uh, aspire to have and would tie in nicely to your ambition. Right. That sounds really good. Persuasion, then. Um, yes. And I will leave the other ones up to you, if you like. Well, I would say sort of of the ones that I've sort of already, I guess, started thinking in, in terms of dots, but uh, I'm thinking, hey, he has been in the military, he he has learned basic medicine, like first aid. He he knows how to patch up a wound, uh, because he's had to do that for uh, for for a lot of friends who are no longer uh, no longer alive. Uh, and um, close so combat. he's not very good at it. No, he, he can just <laughs> do the basics, you know. He, he's probably saved someone, but it's Probably it's mostly just about making people comfortable at the, the at the end of life, so to speak. It's uh, difficult to treat gunshot uh, wounds on the battlefield. It is. Uh, and uh, what was the last one you just mentioned? I think close combat is uh, something that he should be uh, at least not not particularly. He doesn't have to be super capable in it, but he should be able to hand him, handle himself. And if if it turns into fisticuffs, he is after all an agent, and uh, yeah, he cannot be completely reliant on his gun so it would be nice to at least go with with one on that later on so yeah that's one that i've been thinking about is there is there any others that you see as being sort of fitting to what i've described about the character uh no i think that's a decent spread to be honest and and don't forget you will have the additional six points that you can assign wherever you see fit so everyone gets 15 skill points uh to uh, uh, well to 
spread across their skills. Only nine of them are restricted by that path definition. The remaining six can go wherever you see fit. So, while you're all doing that, and a couple of you may already have done so, we then move on to attributes. And attributes, as anyone familiar with the storyteller or storytelling uh, system will be familiar, are your your raw uh, traits, your raw base of knowledge, your physical, your mental, and your social. Now, there's nine attributes, and you have to rank the arenas, your physical, social, mental, in which your character is most de- adept. Uh, not necessarily what you prefer, it's just what you're better at. So, for instance, uh, as an example in the book, uh, an amateur private eye may be more adept at social than mental, uh, but likewise may be more uh, adept at mental than physical, so it will be ranked social, mental, physical. But you can assign them in any order you wish. Every character begins with a single attribute dot in each of their attributes. You then distribute six dots among the three attributes in your top-ranked arena, four in your middle, two in your bottom-ranked arena. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So none of your characters will have zero in an attribute. Very good. And then I believe you then also have a favoured approach. You do indeed. Uh, Thank you. Well done for reading ahead. Because, uh, yes, you have a favoured approach as to how you apply your, your attributes. And that for those favoured approaches are force, finesse, and resilience. You place one additional dot in each of the attributes in your character's favoured approach. So essentially you're going down, 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 and then you're going across, across, across. Although you're only going to be going across once, if you picture the attribute table in your mind. So uh, once you've allocated your dots in terms of arenas, we then look at approaches. So very simply, Craig... What I, I can kind of picture your character's order, but uh, but it may not be what I'm expecting. So, what arenas does your scientist uh, favour, and uh, what are they weakest at? I should say. Well, I had been reading this section while you guys were talking earlier, so I think hopefully I've actually done the whole thing. Uh, hopefully, ah. uh, but what I will say for now is I chose to favour mental then social, and finally physical. Okay, and what's your favourite approach? Force, finesse, or resilience? Force. Mm, so intellect, might, and presence. Yes, and then with a final little free dot as well, it says here, I believe I have my rankings of an intellect of five, a might of three, a presence of three, a cunning of two, dexterity, two. Manipulation, two. Resolve, three. Stamina, two. Composure, three. So as you can see, largely my mental skill stats are my best. My physicals aren't great, though they're not the worst. And then likewise, some of my social skills, again, not terrible, but not great. I definitely focus my most attention on my mind. Although I do have some might, because even though I'm not a strong man, I'm very determined sometimes, despite my frail stamina and dexterity. No, no, I, I like that a lot. And, uh, well, yeah, that tells us a lot about your character. And I think what we can say from the breakdown of both your skills and your attributes is, while you have an incredibly high intellect, uh, you have zero empathy. <laughs> So I don't know uh, that that says anything particularly positive about your scientist, but maybe it's not the kind of game where we should. (laughs) Well, I also have a reason for... uh, You know what, I I can tell this reason because it will come apparent in play very quickly. You see, I have a leg injury that for my entire life... Well, not my entire life, since the incident, has meant that I require a cane. Uh, So that's why Dexterity 2 is very low, because... I'm not going to be running around very good on a cane. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think that, that works well, and it gives us a nice picture of your character as well. 
And uh, one thing I will say, just to, uh, I guess, break proceedings briefly, is we are breaking down the character creation step by step here. And when we initially talked about doing this, I imagined us sort of flowing through it. But I'm actually enjoying this. It's uh, it's fun to have a chance to get a bit of back and forth with the players. And hopefully the listeners are enjoying uh, the explanation of the characters that you're going to see in play or hear in play soon. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's good with a nice uh, Session Zero style <clears throat> thing as well. And you can decide whether or not you want to listen to it uh, as a listener. Exactly. So, speaking of B.C. Rosberg and people wanting to listen to him or not... Yes. I am uh, not that far ahead as uh, as Craig has progressed, uh, so I might need a bit more of an... Uh, a moment. Well, would you say, Matthias, yes. are you feeling more ready? Maybe you could go next. Perhaps, at least in terms of ranking the arenas, I feel pretty good. I, I had a breakdown of the um, of the attributes before. Um, I'm not sure if I've gotten the numbers right, but my, my idea was uh, that the arenas would be social, mental, and then physical last. Okay, so that's two characters with physical last. I'm hoping BC brings out something surprising, but if but if not, if not, that's absolutely fine as well. Uh, and then in terms of the next part, the favorite approach, I was thinking finesse, resi- uh, finesse, resilience, and then force. Uh, well, you time. only need to pick one. Right, so, so finesse. finesse. Yeah, finesse works fine. Mm-hmm. That's cunning, dexterity, and manipulation that you'll get an additional dot in. Yes. Okay, then. Uh, so, yeah, Hjalmar, for BC, we basically need to work out whether uh, his strength is in physical, mental, or social as a primary. Uh, right. I, I imagine it will be physical if the the life of an adventurer is, I guess, prime for him, but just because it may be the most important thing to him doesn't mean he's necessarily adept at it. He may be more more sociable than physically capable, which means social could be primary, physical could be secondary, and mental could be tertiary. Uh, what do you think? I like the idea that he is quite clever too, which is why he's able to sort of pick up thing, pick things up, and actually do something and surprise people in that way too. I, I like him of mm, being the kind of person who who is kind of good at picking up just about anything and and do it, but and sometimes surprises in the way he does it. Okay. But, I don't really mind which way we go because obviously it can't be omnipotent, uh, but we c- it could be either that he does it mostly physically that he comes in and uh, shows off. He uh, has perhaps great balance from working up there in on the heights and. Uh, well, I'm I'm actually I'm enjoying that concept. The idea that people might think he's a dumb muscle head, yeah, because he likes to jump out of planes or he likes to. Uh, I don't know, water ski, if if that's much of a thing in the 1950s. Yeah. But, uh, in fact, he is an accomplished expert. Yeah, he figures it out on the fly. He, he's quite smart. At, okay, so that's how it works. Now, look at me. I'm doing this too, you know. Well, I... So I'm tempted to say mental first. But yeah, what me you, too. So, or what you could do is still go physical first, but when you look at favoured approach... Look yeah. at the uh, the way he applies himself, yeah. so or vice versa. I think the way we're looking at the character now, it makes it more interesting to be mental primary, um, yeah. maybe physical. Actually, yeah, physical secondary and social tertiary. Yes, and um, for your favorite approach to probably be hmm, resilience, because I think you put yourself through what you do through your pure resolve and and well as the attributes are defined your resolve your stamina and your composure you don't let these things phase you people have underestimated you all your life yeah it's it's grit and 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 will that he decides okay now i can do this too i'm gonna just throw myself in there and do it yeah Yeah. i don't need a university education to tell me how to do this exactly exactly okay that's really cool so 
Um, once again, what does that mean that I have this order? How do I assign the uh, points for the attributes then? So, uh, your mental attributes are intellect, cunning, and resolve. Uh, they each have one dot in to begin. You also now have six dots to spread between them. Uh, your physical attributes are might, dexterity, and stamina. Uh, they also start with a single dot in, and you have four dots to spread between them. Yes. And your social attributes of presence, manipulation, and composure start with one dot each, and you have two to spread between them. Now, from there, we have a favoured approach, which we've chosen as resilience, which is resolve, stamina, and composure. Each of those gains an additional dot. And then you finally have one last dot to assign wherever you see fit. Great. Okay, cool. Then I'll... Uh make those a bit more specific as we go on I suppose. Lovely. Uh, so then we go on to trademarks. Now trademarks are your signature moves, your specializations, the way you use your scenes and uh, your skills, your attributes to gain directorial control over a scene. Um, essentially if you use your skill in the way that the trademark states and your trademark can be as defined or as woolly as you like, but it's best to make it somewhere in the, in the middle. Uh, if you use it, you get to roll two additional dice, and then if you succeed, you gain directorial control. And what directorial control is, is essentially you become the director, the narrator, or the GM, if you want, at that point to narrate exactly what happens next, what the alien does, what the evidence says. You start gaining control uh, as the director, as the name implies, because effectively you have applied yourself in such a way as to divert the course of fate, divert the course of the, the plot. Uh, so trademarks aren't always used because they're often... Uh, that Well the descriptions can't be applied to every single situation. But when they are used, and they're used successfully, they can be quite powerful. So as an example, we've got things like mind like a calculator. You can link it to intellect. Swims like a fish, linked to athletics. Or always an excuse, linked to larceny. And I believe we have a whole list of example uh, trademarks later on in this chapter. So you can make them up, or you can choose the ones in this uh, in this book. I'll give you some examples. For every man, every man will gain two trademarks, uh, and for being an every man, and those include Mama Bear, Jack of all trades, I can fix this, I'm the manager, General Strike, got the groove, loaf in the oven, and get off my land. Now, some of them are more well-defined than others, but the kind of point of the game is to find interesting ways to use these trademarks. These are basically things you're known as. So, to use Get Off My Land, that's a relatively simple one. If you're defending your land and you use uh, Get Off My Land assigned to Aim, you can say you're invoking it, you gain your two additional dice. If you use it and you succeed, congratulations, you get directorial control. Something like, uh, I can fix this, logical place to put it would be with technology, and so it goes. If you are feeling particularly creative, you can assign trademarks to skills or attributes that don't seem at all connected, <laughs> and then it becomes a bit of a mental exercise for you as the player to, uh, to choose how you're going to use it, but I leave that entirely up to you. Well, those kinds of things, like Jack of all trades and I can fix this, sounds like something that would work nicely for someone who likes to pick up everything and being sure that he can do it. Yeah, I agree completely. And uh, so for G-Man, we have trademarks that include... Uh, this is totally my pay grade. Man, please step away from the alien. License of registration, please. It was a dark and stormy night. Cut through red tape. Badge and gun. Just a small town boy, and nothing to see here. So again, you would get uh, two of those for being a G-Man. Right. Yeah, I like um, this the idea of, of, of he should be able to have 
this authority as an agent and, and be able to get uh, people to sort of listen to him and to sort of do what he wants. So I think this license registration please uh, kind of fits in, in there that he he can demand things from people and, and get them to, to do what he wants. Mm-hmm. So maybe assign that to what? Where would that be? Would that be could that be connected to like Probably manipulation? Command, maybe. Yeah. yeah, it's likely you're going to be demanding that from someone. Although if you can find a different way of uh, using it, kudos to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then cut through red tape looks exciting as well. I'm not sure exactly what to connect it to just yet, but but I want to connect these with the social uh, social skills in some way and and sort of. You can attach it to an attribute, so you could use cut through red tape with cunning, let's say, uh, because it's a way or you you realise you can work your way around the bureaucracy. You could use it with manipulation for the same reason, uh, or you could put it with persuasion or maybe even empathy, uh, because. The idea of cutting through red tape is you're finding a shortcut, of course, to to the end of a mystery or to get into a secret room or something like that. And if you're determined to use it with a social attribute or skill, those might be some good ones to use. Yeah, no, but manipulation would be fun, I think. Cut through red tape. And okay. license and registration could then be a well, command. Yep. So then we have our scientist, and trademarks include mental gymnast, the smartest person in the room, surgeon general, a taste for danger, high blood pressure, force of nature, streams of jargon, and seeing beauty in horror. Well, I think the smartest person in the room certainly comes out straight away and sounds logically like it would go with intellect. Mm Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, I would suggest, as an example, you'd be using this when you when you prove that you're the smartest person in the room. So, if you were to correct someone and then say, "Actually, it's this," you would be using the smartest person in the room because everyone would say, "Oh, yeah, so he is." Of course, I really like seeing beauty in horror, but I'm not sure how that can actually be beneficial, really, or what's that I could put it to. Hmm. Use it to seduce an alien, uh, inadvertently or otherwise. Uh, Being able to relate to an alien. If you had picked any empathy, I would say that seeing beauty and horror could work quite well with that. Uh, But likewise, you could attach it to something like persuasion, uh, because you're trying to persuade others to see beauty and horror. I mean, there's one I was thinking of if we could make them up. I did want to do something that linked to enigmas, implying I'm library, like I'm very good with books. Something like okay. very well so, read. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we could do something like fast, a speed reader or uh, or read between the lines. Yes, read between the lines. I like that. Read between the lines, that's for my enigma skill and probably comes up whenever something to do with mystery solving involves in-depth reading. Exactly. A bonus there. There we go. Well, there you go. There's two then. The smartest person in the room for intellect and read between the lines. Enigma. So then we have our origin paths and our trademarks from there. So we have a life of privilege, so sticking with you, Craig. Uh, Some examples are I know what you want, I cannot tell a lie, big stick, desk jockey Bonaparte, and Professor Oddball. I can see which one you're probably going to go for. Uh... But uh, so this is uh, how you, yeah, how your character grew up, and a trademark that kind of relates to it. But again, you can attach to a skill or attribute. Hmm, interesting. I mean, I like the sound of Professor Oddball, but what exactly does that mean? Well, it means whatever you want it to mean. Uh, but as an example, it can be that you are so eccentric and so out there that people are naturally intimidated by you. I could so, make it to presents. Exactly. Ah, oh, let's go with that one then. Yes, I am a tad eccentric, Professor Oddball. It's not that I'm like, you know, going around wearing a silly hat. It's more that I'm quite abrasive to people and start ranting at them occasionally, and that does intimidate people sometimes. So let's say Professor Oddball for presence. Excellent. And we also have our suburban uh, in the form of our adventurer. Uh, some trademarks here include not soft. Deprogramming, gadgeteer, cultured warrior, a degree in what? 
What is that? A uh, degree in what? Uh, so that would be you have some bizarre degree that no one else has heard of. Uh, okay, okay. I thought it was more like uh, who cares about degrees? I can do this anyway. But those are more like the uh, the early ones that we did. I also saw something like improvised melee massacre. Oh, uh, I don't. Let's see, improvised melee massacre. That is in the game. Uh, let's see where it is. Um, I don't know whether we have that as a trope. Or as a... No, that is a trademark. We do have that down. And that is down as an adventurer trademark. So yeah, that's uh, moving on to your ambition. But by all means, have that as your uh, adventurer uh, <laughs> trademark, if you like. And this could... By no means does this have to be a trademark that your character has used before. This can be something they discover they have uh, the capacity to use during the course of the story. Right. So how many do I choose? So you choose two for your archetype, one for yeah. your origin, one for your ambition. Right. Okay. 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 Great. So that could be for my ambition, as in the origin, and then we'd have the jack of all trades, and I can fix this for the archetype, and then uh, for the uh, suburban origin. Yes. What did we say here again? So the suburban origin, we have a few options. Um such as not soft, as in despite your upbringing, you're not soft. That works for you. Deprogramming would generally imply that you have uh, shown a resilience to brainwashing or, uh, let's say, state education or religious education. Gadgeteer, you can get anything to work. Cultured warrior is would be a strange fit for you, actually, because you are in a sense, a warrior in the form of being an adventurer, and you're cultured in the way that you're not educated, but you have found culture for yourself. Uh, so that that would work as an interesting... Uh, you know, it, you could almost use it for whenever you're making a culture role or a persuasion role or something like that to show, oh, hang on, this guy isn't what he seems. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That, that, that fits, fits perfectly. Fun, fun. Okay. And we also have our G-Man Street Rat. Yes, and Larceny is uh, the uh, the skill that I want to connect to. The quickness of the hand deceives the mind. Okay, that was nice and easy. So that just leaves us with Ambition. And we've already ascertained that um, BC's is going to be from the Adventurer Origin Path, which we've moved to Ambition for this character, of Improvised Melee Massacre. <laughs> Uh, which I, I like, you know, it's not what a lot of people go for because it sounds so utterly violent, the word massacre does that, but uh, I think it's, it could make for an interesting scene. Uh, so that just leaves us with our scientist and our G-man. Indeed. So what do you think for me? I have an idea, but I'm interested in something maybe you think could be fun, considering out for revenge. Yeah, Talon for Destruction is the obvious choice, I would say, based on the options listed. I was thinking that one, and I was thinking that makes sense to tie to science, but... Yeah, but we could go for something a little different, and go for Party Crasher. Now, Party Crasher you could actually use as, you know, there, there is something in particular you want to disrupt. Let's imagine your character is a scientist, but someone has attempted to discredit him. Maybe he has been drummed out of some scientific institution, NASA, for instance, in its early stage. Um, and so you are determined to not only prove them wrong, but prove them wrong on the grandest stage of them all. So we could tie this into the plot of the game, where maybe in the next town over they're holding some great seminar to award your rival in the laboratory the medal for uh, scientific excellence, and you're determined to trump his achievement. I like that a lot. What could we link that to then? Uh, ooh, let's think. Probably, I know you've already linked something to presence. You could link it to something you wouldn't expect, like might, or maybe manipulation. Uh, if you're looking at skills, science, again, would work quite nicely because, after all, you're looking to uh, show other people up with your excellent use of science. Yes, maybe it should be science because then I've got... Because I have one for intellect, so maybe one for science, which is one of my high skills, would be good. So let's do that. I am a party crasher in a science. And out, out of interest, what kind of scientist are you? Uh, 
in terms of the three main fields of science being biology, chemistry, and physics. I think, even though I wanted to do the all of them, I think realistically, let's say <laughs> physics. I am a physical uh, physicist. And you didn't take any dots in medicine, did you? I did not. No, so biologists probably wouldn't work out very well. Uh, okay, so that just leaves us with our G-Man, and you wanted to go for uh, family, if I recall. Family man. Yes, and I like this. Uh, we have ways of making you talk, and I was thinking to link that with empathy. I'm sure you're going to be a delightful father <laughs> with We Have Ways of Making You Talk. <laughs> Indeed. And I just wanted to go back maybe to Archetype uh, again, and, and uh, I was thinking badge and gun, and then connecting that with aim rather than uh, cutting through the red tape. Oh, I like that. You could use it almost as a distraction, you know? Uh, essentially, these trademarks are flexible. And if you were to narrate the use of it and say badge and gun, if you flash your badge before firing it, it almost gives you the the drop on your opponent uh, by it's the it's the police use of freeze hands up, and uh, that at which point you open fire because you don't give a damn. It's the nineteen fifties. They're probably communists, most likely. Yes. Okay, I think that actually sums up trademark. So, relationships are a nice, easy part of which we can uh, we can summarise in about three minutes, if not fewer. And it's how your characters connect to each other. Uh, so, this is something we haven't talked about yet, but it's something worth coming back to. Essentially, in a um, three-player game, each character is going to have two relationships on their sheet, and it's going to be the other two characters and one of them will have a rank of two one of them will have a rank of one these are the intensity of the relationship and the definition of the relationship is where it gets important because as long as you are acting in a way that that relationship is defined you gain that intensity's worth of dice when rolling so for instance if bc has an intensity two relationship with scientist and it's let's say uh, let's say BC's relationship with him is uh, oh, resentment, for mm. instance. Uh, if you are acting in a way where your character resents what he is doing, then excellent. BC gains two additional dice because of that relationship. It essentially encourages players to play the characters in the way that they they've built the party. So you don't have to come up with this right now. You can think about this. This is almost a. This is usually the last step, because the last thing we have beyond that, and there's some various things we can choose after this, like uh, like tropes and uh, connections that go beyond the game itself, uh, well, beyond the immediate party itself. The last thing we do is draw quips. Mm. So I'm going to explain to you what quips do. Quips are your one-liners your uh, award-winning moments, the quotes that you make that will be put into the trailer of the movie. And when you use your quips, you gain an advantage. You often turn to quips at the worst possible moment, or the best possible moment. They don't have to be appropriate, they just have to be entertaining. And when you, when you use them, you get to roll additional dice, if the rest of the players believe it was an appropriate or entertaining, I should say, use of the quip. Simple as that. So in the most simplistic terms, you roll two additional dice if they have voted that the quip was entertaining, and then you get to do something. You get to either retain that quip and add a new one to your selection, or spend that quip and purchase the use of a cinematic for free, effectively. And so I'm going to explain to the listeners what cinematics are very quickly. Cinematics, and they came from beneath the sea, are meta powers. These are powers that the players wield, not the characters. And it's the players wielding them in the role of producer, if you like, over the movie, over the game that's being told. 
These cinematics range everywhere from inserting deleted scenes, so that if you forgot to do something in a previous scene, you can go back in time and do it again. Maybe you forgot to ask that vital question or pick up your gun from the drawer before you left your office. You can insert a deleted scene, that's I think a three-point cinematic, and go back and do it. Likewise, you can uh, insert a missing reel, a missing scene. If it looks like Doom is approaching, three-point cinematic is missing scene, it cuts to black, your characters move forward into the future. They can never refer to what just happened because they will never know what just happened. All we know is there's a missing reel there, it cuts to black, they survived it. They can make vague allusions to what happened, but they can never know for sure. There's uh, less powerful ones, such as, uh, let's see, Killing the Extra. So if your character is about to meet their death or just about to be shot simply or stabbed or something like that, you can redirect the damage to poor Angus standing next to you who was just an extra with a single name, had no speaking parts. You're almost obliged to hold that character and go, No, Angus, when they're dying in your arms and probably swear justice for his death. But the point being, you have these cinematic powers. Usually, in order to pay for cinematics, you need to use something called rewrites. And this is, this is about as complex as the game gets. Every time you fail, you gain a rewrite in the rewrite pool. So every time you fail a dice roll and you can choose to fail, you gain one rewrite in the writer's pool. Cinematics cost a number of rewrites to activate. Or, if you successfully use a quip, the cinematic is free. It is as simple as that. I will be keeping a tally of the number of rewrites the party starts with. They start with three at the beginning, and how many they go on to have during the course of the game will depend on how many times they fail at their dice rolls. They need to roll eights and above to succeed. But that is the, mo the, I guess, crunchiest part of the game, but it's also the very interesting mechanical side of the game. Now, to go back to quips... In They Came From Beneath the Sea, as traditionally written, quips are often quite fun. They're quite silly. Uh, they range from everything from, let's see, I'll uh, find the list now. They range from, it's time we put the eye in survival, or sorry if I parted your scales too close, or I've smoked worse things in my pipe, through to something tells me those aren't antennae to wake me well and the world is saved, that sort of thing. It's very B-movie-esque. Our game isn't going to be quite as farcical as that. I have my own list for uh, another version of They Came From Beneath the Sea that I'm currently working on, which is more horrific in, in sensibility, uh, provisionally titled They Came From Beyond the Stars. We're still going to be going for the aquatic theme in this game. But what I'm going to ask our players to do at this point is roll some dice. And I will assign to them from the different uh, quip lists based on their archetype the quips that they end up with. So so we're going to start with you, Craig. Could you roll for me um, a... Let's think. We'll roll 2d10, please. I rolled a 2 and a 7. Okay, then. So I'm just adding those together. So your first quip, you'll want to note this down, is do what you want with them, just please leave me alone. Do what you want with them, just leave me alone. Uh, if you could roll 2d10 again, please, Craig. Certainly. If you get another 9 in total, I will just adjust by one or the other. That is a 7 in total. This quip is, this is God. Very interesting. And one more time, please. That's a seven again. Okay, I'm going to adjust it by one, which leaves you with a very interesting Krun Ia Ia Schlenguato. Yes, <laughs> I, see, I see where we're coming from now. <laughs> if you can find an entertaining point at which your character would use that... <laughs> I shall keep it in mind. I would, uh, I would suggest that your characters don't until they have encountered something that would suitably break their mind, but by all means, if you want to build it into their backstory that they're cultists, you can do so. Uh, Hjalmar, if you could roll your 2d10, please. We got six. Uh, so on your everyman, six is Flun a Drollkly Yogsothoth. Sounds Dutch. Yeah, it does a bit, doesn't it? 
Okay, roll 2d10 again, please. Um, 13. 13 is We Have Entered Hell. Nice. We're definitely getting some tone here already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's gone a bit Event Horizon at this point. Yes. 11. Please help me, Daddy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what was once a fun and uh, light-hearted game has uh, suddenly turned quite desperate. Yes. Uh, Matthias, we have uh, your G-Man to go. All right. I'll begin rolling, and I get uh, six and seven, so that's 13. Uh, 13 is give yourself to them. Mm. All right. You could still use that in a G-Man capacity, you know. That's right. Kind of. Kind of, yeah. That's true. (laughs) It's not quite turn yourself over to the police. (laughs) Give yourself to them. All right. Okay. Next up, I get a nine. Nine, we're all going to die. Nice. Yeah. I can see that that will probably get some use. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I get a... 15. Oh, lovely. Okay. 15 is Kek Nok Terran Shatha. Kek Nok Terran Shatha. All right. <laughs> so, uh, just to uh, remind you, if you use your quips in a way that the rest of the group believe is entertaining uh, or horrifying in this game, you get to use a cinematic for free or you get to not only keep this quip, but take another quip later. You get to roll two additional dice if your quip is voted a good use of a quip. So, usually you would pair it with a dice roll. You don't have to, and you will still get the benefit, you just won't get the two additional dice, quite simply. Make sense? For now, mostly yes. So, does it is it associated with something we do? Is it associated with an accent? Uh, an a- is it associated with an action, or is it just something you could pull out the bag? If you... you associate it with an action, you'll get your two additional dice. If you don't, you can still use it, and you can still purchase a cinematic for free um, for later use. So, uh, either way, it, it, it is workable. Uh, it's just, I guess, it's most effective if you're about to roll some dice as well. So, for instance, you're about to shoot something, and you shout, This is God, referring to your pistol. Uh, and <laughs> or the bullet, uh, then you get to add an additional two dice to your aim roll. Make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So going back to the idea of cinematics and the fact that we've just suddenly veered down a rather dark turn of they came from beneath the sea, those cinematics are still in play. I'm not going to introduce any new ones for the course of this game because you've not played with the old ones yet. But the way you play them is slightly different, because you as players aren't producers in this game, like you could be considered in They Came From Beneath the Sea. You are, for all intents and purposes, great old ones. The use of your cinematics is your godlike powers. You are, for some reason or other, playing with, toying with, or protecting your chosen vessels. Are they going to be your avatars? Are they going to be your high priests at some point? Have you selected some great fate for them? Maybe they're just uh, bound to be sacrificed in your name. But when you do things like kill the extra now, you aren't doing it for comedic effect. You are intentionally getting in the way of the bullet and redirecting it towards some hapless bystander. Your character may start losing their mind if things like this keep happening, because they'll become aware that there is some divine, to use probably the wrong term for great old ones, force intervening on their behalf. Now when you insert a deleted scene and go back in time, those characters are, for all intents and purposes, going back in time and repeating that scene. When you are inserting a missing scene, they will black out. They will have no explanation for what has just happened and for how they've moved forward in time and space beyond the fact that the great old ones are intervening, as they may become aware. So very disturbing for them when these things happen. When, yeah, when any cinematic happens, it's it would mess with your mind. 
Yeah, and this is the difference between they came from beneath the sea in its uh, traditional incarnation, but it's easily adjusted to this horrific incarnation, where pawns on the chessboards of the gods, if they ever become aware that they are pawns, it will break their minds, because in the Call of Cthulhu style, man is not meant to know what exists out in the void. And you three exist out in the void. Can I just say, I absolutely love it. That sounds great. Nice and grim. So now we're going to be looking at tropes. Tropes are a fun little feature that archetypes have. They are powers that characters start play with. Each uh, character starts with three tropes. And each... Um, well, we'll start with the everyman, in fact. And do you have the chapter two open, each of you? Because if not, now's the time to do it. This is where the tropes get uh, detailed in full. And tropes aren't... or they sometimes are, but they don't tend to be mechanical benefits. Some of them are like, add plus two dice to this kind of roll, and that's a trope that's designed for a player who likes that kind of mechanical crunch. Some of them are incredibly narrative heavy, and we'll go into some of those as we go on. Uh, so, for example, looking at the everyman, as we have an everyman in the group, I will read out some of the tropes as examples, and by all means you don't need to pick the ones I've read out for you, uh, because there's quite a few here. Mm -hmm. uh, the top one, grit and determination. You never let no, you let, never let not knowing a thing stop you. With a little grit and determination, you can rise to the challenge. Roll one extra die on actions that are outside of your character's archetype. So, in other words, anything you're doing, any of your skills that aren't within your everyman bracket, you gain additional dice on. So now you can kind of start to see the importance of where you're putting those dots at character creation. We also have things like uh, an honest day's wage. You aren't rich, but you seem to always have money on hand and ready whenever the situation requires it. You can always bribe incidental characters or pick up whatever gear or items you need as long as it makes sense. The director is the final arbiter of what makes sense. So that's a more narrative power. And then we have something like picket line. You've worked the line before, so you've been on a strike, and you know what it takes to crack a company. Roll one extra die on actions in which you lead others against an opponent more powerful than your group. And that can be as uh, grandiose, as nebulous as you like. But each character starts play with three tropes. The everyman chooses two from the everyman list and one from any of the other archetypes. So... Or can actually be from the everyman list if you want, but I prefer for it to be from one of the others. It makes the characters more interesting. So what are we looking at for BC here out of these tropes? What appeals to you? Well, I do like the first you read there, the grit and determination about not knowing... Not... I know, it's a, it's a complex double negative, isn't it? You never <laughs> let not knowing not a thing stop you. <laughs> exactly. He can do... He, he believes, he genuinely believes that he can do anything if he just rises to the challenge like you said there and uh yes gets an extra die on rolling things that are outside of the archetype and those would be the skills then that i have not put as my archetype skills exactly yes all right so i'd, I'd like to go with that one and then i found honesty is the best policy which i could read too You've learned that people respond best when you lay it all out, even if they don't want to hear it. Gain one plus enhancement to shifting attitudes in a social situation if you tell the complete truth. So enhancements are what makes your uh, dice rolls, your challenges, easier or more difficult. Uh, you have enhancements and you have complications. And a plus one enhancement essentially uh, makes the grade of difficulty... Uh, one less, despite the fact it's a plus one. So, gain plus one enhancements, shifting attitudes in a social situation if you tell the complete truth means if you're being honest with people, you're going to find it uh, slightly easier to convince them of what you're trying to tell them. Cool. And, yeah, maybe he'll have to go about that the hard way sometimes, that he's first trying to say the wrong thing and then trying to say the right thing. Exactly. Uh, but uh, did you have any other in mind for that character? Or well, we'll get to that in a sec, uh, because we'll go through the other ones, and then what I'll do is circle back around to you and see whether you've picked a third one from the G-Man, or, uh, or, or indeed the Scientist, the Survivor, or the Mouth. I'll let you look through the rest of the tropes on this in this chapter and see what you come up with. 
Uh, one thing I will say just before I move on uh, to we'll go on to uh, Matthias and uh, Agent Faulkner very shortly is every archetype has a nemesis. Uh, nemesis is one of your alien brackets. There's five alien uh, brackets. So you have your destroyers, your enslavers, your invaders, spies, and primordials. Uh, there's lots of aliens within each bracket. Now, the uh, every man gains one additional die on all mental-based rolls against primordials. Uh, both of them essentially act as the blue collar, the very basest of creatures in their chosen society. So every man can outthink a primordial, because every man's got common sense. However, primordials gain one additional die on all mental base rolls against every man, because they're fairly evenly challenged. So a physical or social role between the two of them is at uh, dice neutral. You gain no modifiers, no disadvantages. But if you're trying to do a mental roll against each other, you start rolling additional dice. It's one of those things that's worth noting down. Uh, it helps you in a uh, to use a reference from another game. Looking at D and D or Pathfinder, Rangers have favoured enemies. In this game, you have favoured enemies as well. Or uh, unfortunately, it works the other way round as well because you have a least favoured enemy uh, because they gain advantages against you. So moving on to the G man. Yes. We have a few interesting tropes here. I'll read out a couple again, and you can tell me out of the list uh, which two from the G-Man list you want, and which and don't tell me the third one from another list you want just yet. So as examples, we have disappearing acts. You've been trained how to lose a tail, even in the most unlikely of circumstances. You can disappear into a crowd as small as ten people and somehow lose any tail that might be following you. There's also sunglasses. It's all about the look. Gain plus one enhancement when interrogating someone. Nice and simple. So what are you thinking? So it's really interesting that you uh, picked those too. <laughs> because when I've, I've, been, I've been looking at, uh, at the tropes again. And uh, I really like particularly those two. A disappearing act. Um, I think that given you know, the larceny part of what I have. I think being able to disappear is, is something that both makes sense that my character is able to do and will probably come quite in handy. And uh, then sunglasses. Interrogating someone is, of course, an interesting way of uh, putting it. Would, would it be specifically in an interrogation room type situation or can a conversation where you're trying to get information also qualify as an interrogation? Uh, I think so. I think you could use it. That, and again, I mentioned it before, but part of the fun of this game is its flexibility. If you can find an interesting way to use your trope, do it. And I'm not going to stand in the way. Then uh, sunglasses it is. I, I'm going to read one more of these because I find it a, a lot of fun. It's an inside job. It's been you this whole time. In a scene in which your character isn't present, you can declare that your character is actually masquerading as another minor character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that Jean Parmesan uh, idea of, you know, ripping off a moustache and it's been you there all along. <laughs> uh, so, your nemesis is you gain one additional die on all physical-based rolls made against alien spies. Hmm. Uh, you know how to tackle them, you know how to bring them down. Uh, however, spies gain an additional die on all mental-based rolls against G-men. So we have the mouth as well. We don't have any mouths in this group, so I will skip that. But by all means, both of you have a look at the tropes available for the mouth, because you may want to pick one from that list. We have the scientist now. Mm. And the scientist tropes, to read a couple out again. Weird science. You aren't even sure what it does. Roll one extra die on actions when you are using an alien device, even when you lack any familiarity with it. And the one I think everyone has picked on every single game I've ran of this involving a scientist. Atomic power. You have a single item that is nuclear powered. When used in combat, it has the deadly tag. Otherwise, it provides plus one enhancement when used for a specific function. It doesn't specify what, uh, <laughs> what it is that's atomic powered. That's up to you. Uh, so what are you thinking, Craig? Well, the atomic one does sound very fun. <laughs> but also perhaps a little more for a game where we're being a bit more like, I have my cane is atomically powered. Yep. So instead, <laughs> I've decided to go for Eureka, 
which is very good at putting clues together and figuring out the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. In-depth understanding of a clue once a session, and I read a little bit of how investigation in clues work, so that sounds good to me. Yep. I'm also going to go with outside funding, which means I can get the money sometimes when it's needed. Yeah, as it says in the description, no to trash bags, yes to laser death rays. Exactly. And my one pick from another group will be from the Survivor seen too much. You see, I've had, well, the incident in my life that occurred was quite traumatic. Also, I have lived in Britain most of my life till I came to America, and so that means I have been alive for both World War One and World War Two. I was not involved in either, uh, being too young for World War One and uh, my injury, World War Two. but I was in Britain and obviously there were quite some terrible things that occurred during the last 30, 40 years, so I have seen some unpleasant things. And that means uh, you get to roll one extra die to resist mental or social influences. Indeed. I'm stern uh, of will. Exactly. And the uh, nemesis for the scientist is they gain one additional die on all social base rolls against invaders. Invaders gain an additional die on physical base rolls against scientists. So, in other words, scientists, despite how antisocial they often are in these games, uh, tend to be able to talk invaders down, but they don't want to get in a fight with one. I think most uh, most humans would probably agree with that. So, going back round to uh, Hjalmar, have you picked your third trope, and from which list? I have now been looking through the different tropes and... Uh... The lists and one that I do like is the one from the mouth spotlight you thrive when you are the center of attention it may annoy your friends but really you are just that good roll one extra die when you are in the front and center of the action perfect that suits your character down to a T I'd say yes I think so too well, and that just leaves agent Faulkner yes and I think that it would make a lot of sense to have this secret bunker from the Survivor. The Survivor does have some fun tropes. They definitely do. And uh, having a safe house uh, available when needed is something I believe can uh, be very, very useful. Uh, I had one question uh, with regards to that, actually. Is this simply a location that is safe, or... Uh, is it also a location that has some supplies in it, for example, or is that something, again, where flexibility comes in? It's something where flexibility comes in, as long as it's reasonable uh, to the degree of the genre we're playing in uh, at the time you suggest it. So the way it's written is going to ground is your speciality. You have bunkers and safe houses all over. No matter where you are, you have a safe space to fall back to in a time of need. You cannot be followed there. So this isn't something where the rest of the party can join you. This is something that only you can access. So I would assume it's a government, highly classified, highly secure facility even the scientists wouldn't get into. In fact, they'd probably turn him away on the spot. So how much that has in it will depend on where we describe it as being. If it's like a nuclear bunker, uh, fit for one person, then it's probably got some tins and uh, liquids in and, and enough so that you could live by yourself for a few years uh, without fear of radiation poisoning. But if you're near a government facility, we can actually say it's an extension of that and you'll probably have access to arms and armaments as well. Mm. That would actually be quite interesting. I think this uh, this will work. This will be interesting. And it might help explain sort of what I'm doing in this location and the connection with the the rest of the, the G, the rest of the government. Well, it's, uh, it's actually quite a lot of fun trying to pair these tropes with the other archetypes. Because the secret bunker is a survivor archetype, most people would assume a survivor secret bunker would be that kind of out in the woods hatch leading 20 feet into the ground and you've got a concrete bunker filled with your bare supplies um, but yeah as soon as you start associating it with a with a scientist let's say or with a g-man then it starts getting quite interesting even with a mouth for that matter because you'd assume there's going to be lots of tv monitors in there and maybe even a broadcast station that sort of thing yeah, what would they need specifically coming from another uh, archetype? Yeah, 
So I think that's all of it done in terms of your tropes. The only part of uh, character creation we are omitting for this uh, character creation session is the connections stage, uh, which you don't have to do at character creation. You can, in fact, do at... Um, well, later on in the game. This is how your characters' paths connect to the world around them. It gives you contacts, allies, people in various positions in, let's say, government, in private industry, the neighbourhood, and so on, that you can call on for aid. And at, at its basis, it gives you dice modifiers, enhancements in certain areas and around certain people, because people are more inclined to lend a hand. Uh, but uh, likewise, it can start populating the world with an interesting cast. What we're going to be doing is approaching this story as if these characters are brand new, and maybe even if, as if they don't know the environment they're in, they don't know this town. This means that we can form the connections on the go and introduce that mechanic as the, uh, as the game goes on. Uh, the other thing, and this isn't something done at character creation, but I'll explain it for the listeners, is the only powers we haven't covered in this are stunts. Everything else has been covered. Everything else you have access to in this game has been covered. Uh, but stunts have not. And just to explain what stunts are, they are immediate reflex powers. Uh, when you activate a stunt which is listed in the book, you can basically use the power as it is stated in the, uh, in the, in the book. What a stunt might be is if you have succeeded on a dice roll by three more dice than you needed to, uh, then you can activate a three-point stunt to enhance your action in the way the stunt implies. Simple as that. And some of them are like daredevil stunts where you can, um, let's say, vault a canyon on a bicycle. Uh, others might be more scientific. Uh, they might be tied to various archetypes. The reason we're not going into them in detail is because the best use of stunts is when all players can read them, are at least passingly familiar with them, and this is something I think the three players will want to look through the stunt list between sessions, get a feel in their mind of the kind of stunts they're going to be inclined to take, and then make some notes. Uh, one thing I suggest to all players if they came from Beneath the Sea is it's a game that is very... Uh, very strong when you have visual cues. So, for instance, if you have your quips written on a piece of paper or on cards in front of you, so even if you're playing over audio like we are, just having them as flashcards in front of you reminds you to use them. Same with cinematics. Uh, what I often do when I'm playing these kinds of games is I will have a uh, JPEG Rather than having the Word document, I'll have a JPEG open where I have just divided it into a grid with lots of different uh, cinematics noted down and their points beneath them. And so I know I can always call on them very, very quickly. So if you're visually cued like I am, that can help a great deal. And having stunts in a table or some other visually appealing manner is useful. But at this point, we won't, uh, we won't deal with them. That will come later in the game. So... With that said, do any of the players have any questions about their characters? Mm. At this point, I think we've made some really nice progress here, and I've got a general idea of most of the things that he can and can't do, and what he thinks he can do, which is everything. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right, given how you've uh, summed up your character. Yes. We'll see how that how that holds up as the as the game goes on. Yes, I feel confident in who I am, and uh, already some backstory stuff is in mind. Of course, I shall send that to you privately, Matthew. But for now, I think I know who I am enough to at least begin with this character. I think we can assume the scientist is a traitor at this point. Um, out of yes, interest, right, right. <laughs> like, okay, conspiracy yes. subtle, coming. subtle, and we don't actually have a name for the really? scientist yet. So, what is the scientist's name? Doctor Charles White, or Doctor White to all of you lot. Uh, so, the other part of the system that we'll be changing in this playthrough, in typical Lovecraftian fashion, and I'll deal with it now, is. Uh, in They Came From Beneath the Sea, you only have four levels, or well, five levels of injury. One is uninjured, so treat that as if that's what you're on from the very start. Um, then, after you've incurred three injuries, you have just a flesh wound. You're scratched, bruised, otherwise superficially hurt. 
Once you have three injuries and just a flesh wound, all dice pools that fall within your character's archetype gain one die. Simple as that. Because in this game, the more injured you get, the more dramatic you get. It's like a movie, where if a character is walking through a war zone, as soon as they start getting battle-scarred, they start amping up. You know, they're, they're suddenly more heroic. Yeah. Desperation kicks in. Yeah, exactly. The next level is that'll leave a scar. Once you have three injuries and that'll leave a scar, all dice pools that fall within the character's archetype gain two dice. Then the next level is last-ditch effort. Once you've taken three injuries there, you can't take much more, but you might have enough for one more push. All dice pools involved in the character's archetype gain two dice. Further, for any archetype to find roles, you can choose to push your luck. Um, basically, uh, that means you run the risk of dying if you fail. You trigger a death scene. Uh, but the target number is seven rather than eight for successes. So, after last ditch effort, you have one level of health left. Don't forget me. And you only have one injury for that. You have one last gasp inside you. Once you get one, you get one action. And the dice pool for that action gains three dice, whatever that dice pool is. And your target number is seven. After the roll, success or failure, you trigger a death scene. And that can be as elongated and dramatic as you see fit, but you should definitely make it interesting. So the idea being, as mentioned, the more cl the closer to death you get in character in this game, you gain dice. It, it, it compels you, encourages you to take risks and put your character at the forefront of danger because it's the only way you will gain things. Now, as I mentioned, the Lovecraftian element. Well, there always has to be an insanity mechanic, doesn't there, when we're dealing with Cthulhu? And while these aren't strictly labelled at this point, you can essentially treat it as having five levels of sanity, or five levels before absolute uh, irrevocable breakdown. And for all intents and purposes, it works exactly the same way. Uh, with the just a flesh wound, that'll leave a scar, last ditch effort, and don't forget me. Uh, but this is going to be mental strain. And ultimately, if you break, finally, you can say that your mind has opened to the cosmos if you're feeling generous, or you can just say your mind has sunk into the void and it will never be recovered if you're not. So you can die mentally in this game just as you can die physically. Okay? All right. So yes. you, you don't just have physical injuries to worry about. If you get exposed to, let's say, a Shoggoth in the first session, you won't. But if you did, uh, that will, um, for all intents and purposes, more likely than not, give you three injuries to your mental track and give you just a flesh wound. Your mind is starting to break. Shoggoth's probably a bad example because they're probably going to give you a few more than three injuries mentally. But <laughs> you, you get the gist of things. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Certainly. So it's a different way of treating the sanity that's uh, present in most Cthulhu-based games. Okay, then. So that means, I think, we are ready to give our preview of Episode 1. Our characters are, for one reason or other, as we will ascertain, assembled in a small town in Alabama. Alabama isn't known for its coastal resorts, isn't known for its uh, welcoming presence to outsiders even, especially in the 1950s. It's in fact known as a bit of a, a culturally reticent part of the state when it comes to civil progress. But here you are, all three of you. One of you may be native to the area, I'm specifically looking at BC as a potential there. All right. I'm uh, thinking also that uh, our government agent is down in Alabama, in this town called Denton, for governmental reasons. Or maybe he's just taking a furlough, maybe he's just taking a break and getting away from the big city. He's been working in DC too long and he's got family down in Denton family he very rarely sees. It tied into his ambition of being a family man, reconnecting with what he was or what he wants to be. Then we have our scientist. We have Dr. White. 
And does he have a lab down in Denton, or is he down here to experiment on something, or research something in this town? I'm leaving this up to you. Those are teasers, they're suggestions. I turn it to you, the players. Give me a reason why you might be in Denton, on the southern coast. There's a tiny bit of southern coast of Alabama that overlooks the Gulf of Mexico, and this is where Denton is. You tell me why each of your characters is there, starting with Dr. White. And give as much information as you see fit, because there may be some things you don't want the other players to know. Of course. Well, for now, I think it's safe to say that I would rather not be here at all. What could a place like this truly offer someone with my mental ability? Backwater town, but... There are things about the new world that are better than the old. That's why I have come. In this case, the area has some great potential for further scientific study, primarily in the space near the town of Denton. A lot of wide space, interesting conditions for experimentation. Specifically in the weather in the region, I am intrigued by the potential of the storms. I have some weather experiments that could be well conducted in this part of the world. So for now, I'm here. I shall see how things go. If it is not suitable for my needs, I shall be moving on to somewhere else. Very good. And what about BC? My dad is sick. He's, uh... He's got something we don't really know what it is. He's... He's lying in bed most of the time, and, uh, well, I had to come down from New York to, uh, well, from my work on, on the skyscrapers to, well, to be with the family for a little while, and uh, hopefully he'll get better. We don't know. The doctors don't know what's going on with him, um, but he seems to have trouble talking and expressing himself, so now I'm here. And what about Agent Faulkner? Well, my my folks live here. We came to Alabama after leaving Oklahoma behind, and uh, they've been working the, the fruit fields here. And I've fortunately gotten away from that now. But uh, yes, I'm here seeing them, taking some time away from the crazy life in Washington, from the yes, from all the the backstabbing and all the the politicking over at the FBI office there. Very good. Well, in typical fashion, you start your session in a pub, in a bar. Why not? Jimmy's Bar and Grill. And there's a jukebox. It's hammering out some Jerry Lee Lewis. Great balls of fire. It's all the rage. All the kids are dancing to it. Not today, though. This bar is for older gentlemen, people like yourself. The kids don't hang around this kind of establishment. They're a little too progressive. They go down to the drive-in. They like the disco, such as it is emerging. And it's quiet. The music isn't really stirring anything up. The air is thick with smoke. Jimmy himself operates the bar, as he always has done. A few of you know him, or a couple of you know him, just from time spent down here before. You, you've never known anyone else to run a bar as efficiently as Jimmy. He doesn't brook any violence in this place and little of it comes here everyone knows each other everyone's a good old boy everyone knows the town and respects the bar almost as much as they respect the church you will find yourselves there after a hard day at work or a hard day with your family i imagine a couple of you are escaping those same families given you know in the case of agent faulkner you don't get to spend much time with them and perhaps that's a good thing in the case of BC, well, it's so difficult seeing your dad so ill. You just need to get out and get a cold beer. In the case of Dr. White, well, again, you'd rather not be in a stinking flea pit like this, but a drink's a drink. It may not be British beer, but it might take the edge off. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seeing people I know mostly all around, being back home, and I feel like I'm trying to talk to them and trying to tell them what the cool things that I'm doing back in New York, but they're 
they know me. I'm. They know I'm always trying to stir up something, and uh, they they are hard to impress these days because they just think I'm a bit too much for this town. I'm trying to talk to Jimmy at the bar, saying that, well, you gotta, you know, stick with the times. The, the, you see, you're gonna be left behind when the disco is coming up, and uh, you know. Get some new music in here. Well, I can't say I know as much about that, Benny Clyde. This uh, Jerry Lee Lewis is... Uh, I know. Seems ungodly the way he twists his hips and sings the way he does. But it's the new times. Have you ever been to a dance now recently? Well, maybe for young folks like you. We have a dance hall in town. Opens up once every two weeks. Don't get folks like this down here. If you want to go out there, you fill your boots, but... Jimmy's Bar and Grill stays open for the old-timers. And I'm thinking to myself that I'm not even interested in looking down at the old dance hall, you know. it's Even there, they're falling behind with the times. Even when they're trying to play something new, people don't know how to dance to it. Hell, I, I didn't want this jukebox. It was my daughter that asked for me to install it. We were fine enough with live music. But of course, people move on from small towns like this to find their fortune in the big cities. And I have a sip, and I think to myself, well, thank God they do. Anyway, what's city boy like you doing down here? Uh, well, I don't know if you heard, but some... It, Dad has come down with some stuff. I don't know. He's been in bed now for three weeks. I heard your pops had come down with something. I thought it was uh, coming down with the gout again. Is it worse than that? There's something else. He keeps, uh, he keeps coughing up. Uh, stuff. <laughs> well, it's not. It's not right. It's, it's something the doctors don't know what they what it is. It's, uh... Oh hell, maybe he's got consumption. Happens to uh, a lot of people who work in and around the swamp. Yeah. It's the humidity. Yeah. Hell, I ain't more proud of anything than I am. He slaps the air conditioner than I am of this. Yeah. Pre paid a pretty penny for it too, but it keeps the air in here fresh. He says through the thick cloud of yellow smoke. <laughs> And uh, I, I look up at the air conditioner, uh, struggling and rumbling along there on the wall, and I nod somewhat approvingly of him trying to adjust to things and get something new happening. That's because my daughter says we got to civilize this place, but I don't know. This is an old town with old people, old traditions. Well, if she knows what she's talking about. I mean, she's always been a bright man. If I didn't know you better, BC, I'd say you were angling to court her. <laughs> hey now, hey, we uh, we only went out to dance, I'm telling you, there's it nothing else, just the dance. Oh hey, I'm modern enough to know what you girls and boys get up to, up a make-out point, believe me, I know. Just don't you be doing nothing stupid, you hear? Yeah, yeah, yes sir, I hear you. T further down the bar, a couple of the um, good old boys, dungaree wearers. Uh, having a bit of a giggle about Agent Faulkner, who still hasn't uh, pried himself out of his city slicker suits. That's right, and I'm, um, I've am i positioned myself at, uh, I suppose there's tables at the back of the bar somewhere. I've um, I've come to this place to, to escape Washington, to see my family, but I'm sitting here with a drink, and I've got the newspaper, and I'm... I'm reading about I'm reading about the world falling together about all these old colonies leaving about what year is it? Uh this will be about 1953. 1953. Right. So yes, then I'm reading about uh these civil wars and and about yeah, how how the dominoes are, are starting to, to fall here, how communism is taking over, and I'm, I'm genuinely worried, and maybe it's, maybe it's the alcohol that's, that's making it worse. But, uh... Hey, Hoover boy! What? One of the uh, good old boys from the bar shouts over to you. I look up. What you investigating? I, um, I take up a cigarette and, uh, and uh, I light it. I'm learning about the world. Do you, uh, do you read the paper? 
You seeing what's going on? You seeing what's happening? Heck yes, I can read. What you trying to say? Well, I'm saying you should be worried. There's communists out there, you know. Oh, we don't talk about them kinds in this bar, Hoover boy. Ain't no communists in Alabama. No, that's what I'm here to make sure it stays that way. You here investigating communists? Well, I think I'm always on the lookout for them. But no, I'm here for my folks. Heck, ain't no communists in Alabama. And they have a good old giggle at the uh, bar. Sounds to me like you're wasting our tax dollars. Sending boys like you down to our town looking for pinkos. Well, the government knows more than you, let us just put it that way. But regardless, that is not really why I'm here. But I am on the lookout, so watch yourself. He stands up from the bar and kicks the stool backwards. You say that again, Hoover boy. And I just sit down and I look at him calmly. I look up from uh, my drink. What's he talking about? You you recognize um, Billy Bob. He's always been a bit of an irascible old salt uh, fisherman off the coast usually, but um, by his age you doubt he gets out in his boat very often these days. I'll tell you what he's on about. He's accusing me of being some kind of god-forsaken communist. Aha. Uh-huh. Come on now, Billy Bob. I'm sure he didn't mean it that way. I've worked these waters ever since I was a boy. I always paid my tax dollar to the man, even when I didn't like him. I didn't vote for this government, but there it is. I certainly ain't no pinko. What have you been up to lately, anyways? How 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 have things been? How's the business? Say what? The business? Yeah, yeah, fishing business, right? You come down here with that silly talk. You ain't from around here no more, are you? Well, well... Business is a lifestyle. It's my life. The fishing I can't do it no more, can I? The fish is dried up. What do you mean? They've all gone. They moved on. Pastures new, as they say. I tried moving to new spots. You know, competition around here is fierce. Something fierce. I gotta, I don't know, wait for them to come back, I guess. I, I'm all right. I build up a little bit of a nest egg, but still. Less fish than they was, and the ones I am dredging up ain't too healthy at that. Uh, well that's a damn shame. Damn right it is. Good to hear you got something else going on. You thinking of moving on to something else? Me, my age? Hell, I'm in my fifties. I ain't moving on anywhere but down from Denon. During this whole time, all this conversation going on, people getting out of chairs and back in again, I've just been impassively watching, sipping what I hope is a brandy. It's what I ordered. Whether or not it is, is another case entirely, I imagine. Some th- some kind of moonshine, I imagine. Whether they're actually serving actual brandy in Jimmy's Bar and Grill is uh, debatable. Hmm. Still, I'm watching with passing interest, tapping my cane ever so slightly. Of course, this is all typical of such places in the world. Men like this, they know nothing but the grit, the dirt, and violence. Small minds, small ambitions. The You are the first to see, as you're staying out of the fray, the um, blur of motion past the front windows of the bar. And you pick up over the sound of Jerry Lee Lewis winding down. And someone switched on to uh, Johnny Cash, which is slightly more acceptable uh, in this environment. A mild scream outside that's abruptly cut. I raise an eyebrow in alarm and then look around to see if anyone else is doing anything about this scream. What on earth could that be? Uh, one person, you see a couple of people look up and shrug because uh, they don't hear the scream continue. And they they shrug, they take their drinks, they carry on talking. Uh, a couple of them laugh about it. You know, it must just be some kids playing up. Well, hearing that, my instincts kick in. I'd better look into what's going on here. And uh, I move to, to go to the door to investigate what is happening. Say what, where are you going? And finish your drink. Mm, let me just see what's going on there. You heard the scream, right? You've got to make sure that no one's in trouble. Ah, he just waves his, waves you away. It was just some kid outside, I'm sure. I, ta- I say, and I take another sip. You open the door, 
and on her knees in the doorway, a bloody red scratch. Three, almost like three talons had been dragged across her chest and down to her abdomen, leaving trails of oozing blood. She looks up at you, a young woman, no older than twenty, one ear hanging loose. And she begs, she says, Please, mister, please. Something terrible's happened down at Makeow Point. Some, something came up from the water. Something snatched away. Chip Johnson, he's gone. He's gone. And she screams. And now finally the people in the bar and grill stop. And they pay attention. And it's your call to arms to investigate what has occurred at Makeout Point in Denton, Alabama. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the campaign Terror at Makeout Point, for they came from beneath the sea. Our Game Master was the Gentleman Gamer, Matthew Dawkins, who also created the game. They Came From Beneath the Sea is published by Onyx Path Publishing, and we would like to extend a big thank you to them and to Matthew for doing this actual play project with us. They Came From Beneath the Sea is on Kickstarter until the 24th of January, so please do follow the link in the show notes and check it out if you haven't already. The music for this episode is taken from the Cryo Chamber collaborations Cthulhu, Yogg-Sothoth, Azathoth, Shabnigarath, and Nyalathotep, and is used with permission from Cryo Chamber. Please check out cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more of their lovely dark ambient. Finally, a big thank you to all of our Patreon backers. Creating all of this content would not be possible without your generous support on Patreon. You give us loads of energy, you help us cover our costs, and you open up time for us to record and edit. So, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you ever so much. See you again soon.